Well, good morning, Valley Family Church. How's everybody doing today? Good, happy Sunday. Once again, welcome to church. Welcome to those that are joining us online. Hey, what a beautiful service we've already had. Can we put our hands together? Appreciate the worship team. What a awesome time in worship. We will uh, bring them back a little later, and we're going to keep singing as we close today. Uh, but it is a joy to be with you and to be able to open God's Word together. Did you bring your Bibles today? If you didn't, no worries. It'll be on the screen. But uh, uh, I'm excited, as Kaylee mentioned. We are picking up in a collection of messages we're calling One Way Jesus. Can everyone say One Way Jesus? Over the next number of weeks, we are uh, leaning in to the story of Jesus and specifically looking at the seven I am statements that Jesus makes about himself all through the Gospel of John. How many of you know that we live in a world with a lot of questions about Jesus? There's no doubt that he is a transcendent figure in human history for centuries. His life, his story has challenged, it's compelled, and if he, it's even confused. Humanity, who is Jesus? Who is this guy? What is he like? What did he come to do? And, and what is he doing today? Well, in this collection, that's really what we're exploring. We are going right to the source. We could almost call this series, Jesus According to Jesus, as we look at the claims that he made about himself. And, uh, and it's our prayer, it's my prayer for you, for me, that this fall, uh, as we spend time seeking, pursuing, leaning into the story of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the words of Jesus, that we would, wherever you're at on your journey of faith, whether you're brand new, uh, just coming to know who he is, or you've been following him for quite some time, my prayer for you, for us as a church, is that in these next few weeks that we would grow to know Jesus, to know him, to experience him, to see him, to, to connect to him more personally, more deeply than we ever have in our life. And uh, I think last week, Lex did a great job kicking us off. John 14, I am the way truth in the life today, uh, we're going to turn over to John chapter 6. We're going to look at Jesus' statement, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Are you there in your Bibles, John chapter 6? I'd like to read this for us. Um, it's a little long, so bear with me. Um, and, uh, and we'll jump right in. It says this, let's start in verse 5, John chapter 6, verse 5. It says, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon's brother, spoke up. Well, here's a boy, he said, with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? And Jesus spoke. He said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. You can underline that. He then did the same thing with the fish. When they all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw this sign that Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is coming into the world. Underline verse 15 for me. It says, Jesus then, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself there in John 6, let's just jump down to verse 25. Jesus withdraws and verse 25, it says they, they finally found him on the other side of the lake and they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. 
Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one who he has sent. So then they asked him, well, what sign <laughs> will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who's given you bread from heaven, but it's my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This morning, church, I'd like to take a few moments together to talk to you a little bit about Jesus, the bread of life. Jesus, he is the bread of life. Are you guys ready? Did you come hungry today to hear from him? I know I did. Why don't we... Go to him in prayer, and then we'll get into it. God, we love you so much. What a joy it is, Lord, to be gathered today to hear your word. Lord, the life-giving, life-changing word of God. I ask you, Father, as we share these moments together, I pray you would speak. Holy Spirit, I pray you would take every word that I say today, and you would customize it. Lord, make it real and impactful for each person listening. I pray you'd meet people today some on the mountaintops, some in some pretty dark valleys. God, some right there in between. I pray, Lord, for all of us that you'd help this to be a marked moment in our life, a marked day where we come to see you, Jesus, more than we ever have before. May you be not just today, but every day. Lord, our very bread. We love you. Thank you, Lord, for our time together. And as we leave, may we leave this place, walk and talk and live in and look in a whole lot more like Jesus. We thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everyone who agreed said, amen, amen, amen. Well, have you ever lost something only to realize that what you thought you lost, you actually had with you the entire time? Anybody been there? Yeah, um, a few weeks ago, uh, I lost my debit card. Um, it was increasingly frustrating because it, it came at the worst time. As a family, we were out with our two little kids running some errands when we stopped at Aldi. Come on, any Aldi shoppers out there? Oh, let's go. I knew I loved you guys. This is an Aldi church, baby. We uh, stopped by Aldi because we desperately needed groceries. It was bad, okay? You ever had a moment in your house, you open your fridge, and you're like, oh, Lord. It's one thing to be like, we ran out of groceries. It's another thing to be like, there is nothing to consume in this home. And so we needed food, and we needed it now, today. And so as we were out and about, we swung through Aldi and, uh, and to, get ki uh, to get groceries. But our, our kids were just in kind of one of those moments that your kids just tend to be. It's something about seeing the grocery store, isn't it? Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's like they were just little angels all day. But there's an anointing on the grocery store that just causes all children everywhere to go from being sweet little angels to, uh, well, the place down there. Um, <laughs> not as angel-like. And... Uh, this is one of those days, and, and, but we needed food. So we we're like, all right, we're going to power through, baby. Like, let's get our groceries. And I don't know how many times we told Olive, no, like, we're not buying that or this or these things. And how many bribes we bribed her with. If you will just stay with us at the end, we will, all the candy in the checkout aisle can be yours, honey. If you will just bear with us. So we, we loaded the car. We got to our checkout. And, uh, and they started to, you know, check all the groceries. We got to the point to pay, and, and I went to grab my wallet, and my debit card wasn't there. And uh, anybody had one of these moments? Just like, all right, what do I do? Where's, where's my debit? I start, you know, I checked every pocket in my wallet. I'm checking my pants, my, my jacket. I'm, Alexa checked herself. I'm patting down our children. Like, where did my debit card go? And, and, of course, now, you know, there's a line of people behind us, and 
they're kind of looking at us, what's going on, what's taking so long, we have places to be, and the line's building up, and, and the kids, the meltdown just continues, it gets worse and louder, and man, it was probably only a few moments, but it felt like an hour. Like everybody in all of Portage was staring at us, like what type of father is this? He makes his children cry like this, like what is happening? And so after looking everywhere, and I thought, where could it have gone? I, I, I lost it, I, I couldn't find it, and we eventually just looked at each other, and Alexa looked at me with that look, like, you better figure this out. <laughs> and so eventually we just said, we're just gonna abandon the groceries, sorry. We grabbed our kids and we got out of there. <laughs> we went home, mission failed, still hungry. God, why? And uh, it was on the drive home that it, that it hit me. It hit me. I have Apple Pay. I have Apple Pay. I could have, I could have just, I could have, um, I had, I could have, uh, okay. Um, how many of you know, come on somebody, I was going to get those groceries. Went home, I dropped Alexa and the kids off and raced back to the store and uh, I got my dang groceries. <laughs> uh, <laughs> still didn't find the debit card, but um, come on Apple Pay. And I think if you'll bear with me this morning, uh, <laughs> as random as that story may seem, I think it actually leads us back quite, quite nicely to our teaching text today here in John chapter 6. We read this miracle story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 uh, with a little boy's lunch. You see, John 6, Jesus, he's teaching, he's healing, he's ministering. Really, if you're the book of John, the early chapters, he's kind of going on this rampage of like revealing himself as the son of God and the son of man. And, and he's doing all sorts of things. And, and, he, and he's healing bodies. He's opening deaf ears and blind eyes. He's raising the dead. He eventually is going to walk on water. He, he's teaching about the truths of the kingdom, about who he is and what he came to do. He's talking about things like love and mercy and truth and justice. And, and everything he says, everything Everything he does, it, it's just attractive. There, there, there's, there, there's power in it. There's something different about it. These people that started to follow him, they had heard religious people talk. They'd even come to churches like this and listen to people on stages. But, but when they saw Jesus, there was something uniquely different. And so crowds began to gather began to follow him everywhere he would go. And in one particular day, Jesus is ministering. The Bible says to almost 5,000 men that were there when he realizes that they, this crowd, or maybe even he, was starting to get hungry. <laughs> hungry, it had been a long day, and I have more things to say. There's more people to heal. There's, there's more to be done, and these people need food. So Jesus looks to his disciples. He says, boys, can you go get us some food? The, the group is hungry. And you can almost hear the, the sarcasm and frustration in his disciples when they look to Jesus and say, Jesus, where would we get enough food to feed this many people? There, we, we, we don't have it. There's not enough around. Jesus, I'm, I'm, I'm looking everywhere. There's, there's stores, but they don't have it. Why would you ask us this? But Jesus didn't ask them because he was looking for their answer. He asked them because he was testing them. He knew what he was going to do all along. How do you know when God asks you a question, he's not always interested in your answer? But he's trying to teach you something in the process. And so he says, hey, boys, where are, you, where, where are we going to get food? The disciples say, Jesus, we don't have any. The only food we can find is one little boy. He's got a, five loaves of bread and a few fish. But what is that among so many? And Jesus, how many of you know, he just needs a, a little bit. You see, they needed food, and they realized that what they needed, they had all along. Jesus, he, he takes this loaf of bread and these few fish, and the miracle happens so quickly, you almost miss it. He holds it in his hand. He doesn't have big fanfare. He doesn't say, everybody watch this amazing thing I'm going to do. I'm like a magician. No, in the quietness of his position among the crowd, he takes this small little bit of food, and he, he prays over it, and he blesses it, and then he breaks it. And in the breaking, a miracle begins. And these 12 disciples turn into 
waiters and waitresses as they take this food all around and they start passing buckets of bread and buckets of fish one row after the other after the other until everyone in attendance was not only had not only eaten but they were full and even then there were still 12 baskets of food left over this miracle was amazing and again, it's, you read it so quickly, you can't even sometimes see exactly what's, what's, what, what's, what's going on. But listen to this. The Bible said that there were 5,000 men present for this gathering. But we know that this number doesn't include the women and children who would have been in attendance as well. So it's likely that we're talking about anywhere from 10,000 to 15,000 people that Jesus fed in one moment with five loaves of bread and a few fish. This was a big deal. This was a massive miracle. This man who had been known to heal bodies and cast out demons and even walk on water has now created enough food from nothing to feed a football stadium full of people. You see, the people of Israel, they had grown up hearing stories of old about how God moved in this way. They would have been taught even as children how thousands of years before God provided for the Israelites in the wilderness when they were in between Egypt and the promised land. They had heard the stories of how God rained down bread from heaven, but to them at that point, it was just a story. It was a cute thing that happened in the past, but now the 5, 10, 15,000 that day, they no longer had to hear about the story of God providing food. They saw it. They tasted it. They witnessed the miracle that Jesus did, and you can only imagine how they begin to murmur. <laughs> can you believe it? When this man speaks, he, he, he speaks with authority and power. When he prays, he heals blind eyes and deaf ears. When, but now, now this man can make food out of thin air? <laughs> do, you, do you think this could be the one? Do you? Do you think he is the prophet our ancestors told us would come? Maybe he's the one to restore Israel, to overthrow Rome, to reclaim our, 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 our power. If, 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 if he can do all of that, can you imagine what this man could do with an army behind him? Rome would stand no chance. I know. We should, we should make him our king. We should make Jesus our king. Jesus, he picks up on their murmuring. And I find it so interesting what he does. He knows what their plan is for him, but that wasn't his plan for them. And so he flees. John 6, 15, it says, Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. From the outside looking in, it almost seems like Jesus had the crowds exactly where he wanted them. Jesus, 2024 for president. Vote Jesus. Jesus says, no. Nah. He withdraws from their demand for him to be their political king. You see, Jesus didn't come to be a king, at least not king in the way they wanted him to be. They wanted him to become the king of Israel, to contend with the powers of Caesar and of Rome. But, but Jesus was already a king that transcended what they could understand. He didn't come to have an earthly kingdom. He came to bring his kingdom to earth. And so... Our Savior, our King, knowing humanity all too well and how they would take his power and try to use it for what they thought was best case scenario. He, he withdraws from them, but, but the people don't relent, do they? They keep seeking him. They keep looking for him. And the next day, they catch up with him. <laughs> Yesterday's food, now just a distant memory. Their stomachs are hungry for more. They get into a pretty interesting exchange with Christ. And verse 25 to 35 we just read Jesus and the people they, they they begin to talk to each other and Jesus is trying to help them understand the whole point of the miracle they say rabbi where have you been we've we've been looking for you Jesus says no you've not been looking for me you've just been looking for more food they say well yeah fair enough um, <laughs> but but what do we need to do to get more how do, how do we get more bread? Jesus said, well, it's not about doing, it's about believing, just believe in me. They say, well, 
what are you going to do to help us believe in you? You know, Moses gave our ancestors manna from heaven to eat every single day. And, and Jesus says, no, no, no. Moses didn't give that to them, but God did. And, and now God is giving you true bread from heaven that will give life to all the world. And they say, oh, wow, that sounds delicious. Jesus, give us that bread. We want a bite of that bread. You see, <laughs> they, they couldn't see the message behind the miracle. They were missing the person behind the provision. They were looking for what else Jesus would give them from his hand, but he was trying to point them to his heart. The purpose of multiplying bread was never about bread. It was about something so much bigger, so much more profound, so much more important. And finally, I can, I, I can almost hear the exasperation in Jesus' voice as he turns to them and says, no, no, I am the bread of life. Guys, it's me. It's me. <laughs> you here, you are looking for bread, but, 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 but you've had the real bread with you the whole time. And I've come not just to give you another meal. I've come to satisfy the hunger and the longing of your very soul. John 6, 35, Jesus declares, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Church, who is Jesus? He is the bread of life. He is the bread of life, the bread of life. In the original Greek language, the word here for bread is the Greek word artos, artos, which simply describes the combination of flour and water <laughs> after it's baked. It's food. It's something we eat. It's something we can enjoy. It's a substance that satisfies and fills it. It makes us happy. <laughs> it helps us to feel full. It, it resolves our hunger. Jesus, when he says, I am bread, he quite literally means bread, a, a source of sustenance and of provision, something that will fill you. And he says, I'm the bread, but then he says, I'm the bread of, of life. The word life, I think, is worth us noting. It's actually the Greek word zoe. Uh, in the Bible, there are two kind of main words, there's others, but two main words used to describe life. There's bio and zoe. You can write this down. This will help you. There's bio and zoe. Bio, it speaks to what we normally think of when we think of life. It's physical life. It's biological life. And how many of you know that we need physical food to sustain biological life? But the other word that describes life in the Bible and the one Jesus uses when he says, I'm the bread of life is not bio, but rather a word zoe. Zoe, and I'm sure you're familiar with this. Alexa hit on it last week. The word zoe, it describes life from a different and far deeper sense. Zoe is a word that describes everything we want life to be. <laughs> zoe is the fullness of life, both present and eternal. It's God's kind of life, life that is most deep, meaningful, and complete, life that is blessed, healthy, and full. Zoe is life in the truest sense of what God intended for humanity to experience, and it is the kind of life our souls long for. How many of you know it's great to have biological life, but you can have biological life but not have Zoe life? You can have breath in your lungs, blood in your veins, a job, a career, and a family, but you can live far from a life that is deep and meaningful and compelling, that is blessed and healthy and a whole, that is life the way God intended. This is Zoe. And here in John 6, Jesus is making this audacious claim that he and he alone is the very sustainer and satisfier of this kind of life that humanity longs to experience. He is the bread of life. Jesus is saying, I know that you're looking for bread to satisfy your body, but I am the true bread that you need that can actually bring you real and lasting Zoe life. 
It reminds me of John 10.10 10, where Jesus says, I have come that they may have life. Again, zoe, 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 life. I've come that they may have zoe and that they may have it more abundantly. 1 John 5.12 says, he who has the Son has zoe. Has zoe. But he who does not have the Son does not have this kind of Zoe life. And this morning, church, I simply want to remind and encourage you, wherever you're at today, those online and in the room, that just as he was for the Israelites, Jesus is for you and for me. He is the bread of life. He is the source and sustainer of all that we hunger and ache for in life. It is Jesus and Jesus alone that can truly satisfy the longing of your soul. He is all we need. We just need Jesus. And I think this matters and I think this is important and I think this is something for us to wrestle with and to come to terms with because how many of you know that whether you're a Christian or not, that we live in a world that is constantly competing to be the solution for what we hunger for. Constantly, we, we, we are regularly sold on the many ways we can try to find satisfaction and fulfillment in life apart from Jesus. From the pursuit of success, accomplishments, money and titles to the offer of substances and experiences and mindfulness and finding inner peace to the pleasures of sex and entertainment and a quick affair and a meaningless hookup. Humanity is clawing, scratching and consuming, trying to fill the hunger in our souls, but after each attempt, are often left even more disillusioned and disappointed. It's like the more I scratch this itch without the right thing, the itchier it becomes. But today, if I can, I just want to remind us there is another way. <laughs> and that everything we need, everything we desire, everything we long and ache for, that it can actually be found in Jesus and in Jesus alone. That he is the one who has come to fill all that you need. All of it, all of it, all of it. And I think as those in the room who follow Jesus, the easiest thing for us to do right now is go, cool, I already have Jesus, so this is a message for another day. But I can assure you, it's some of us who think we already have the bread that are most often missing the very bread we need to live the kind of life God has called and created us to. He's the bread. And this morning, while I don't know your story, I don't assume to, I, I, I don't know what you may find yourself seeking, what you're longing for. I don't know where you may feel disappointed or discouraged or disillusioned in life, wherever you're at with our time remaining. My goal today is I'd love to just point us all to the person of Jesus. I'd love to lead us to a fresh encounter and experience with the one who calls himself the bread of life. I'd love to help you today just have a moment, a fresh moment with the one who can satisfy your soul. To help us do that, I, I simply wanna share two thoughts. Two thoughts about how we can find the bread of life in every season. And as we wrap up today, we'll wrap up uh, in a moment of worship and prayer together. And I believe God's gonna move, amen? You guys ready? You with me? Two quick thoughts. How can we find the bread of life in every season? The first thing is this. What encourages us that Jesus is our daily bread. Jesus is our daily bread. You know, when I was younger, one of my favorite things in the world was to uh, make a trip to the Krispy Kreme donut store and get a hot and fresh Krispy Kreme donut right off the line. Anybody remember this? Anybody ever done this? You drive by Krispy Kreme and what? When the light is turned on, they have these lights, right? They hang in the window. When, when, when the light gets turned on, it means that you can come in and you can get a free, fresh, and hot donut right off the uh, maker right there. It's the absolute best. On, on occasion when I was younger, my dad uh, would drive me up to Grand Rapids to go to this Krispy Kreme donut store they have there. 
just so we could experience this moment together. One of my favorite memories in the whole world. But you know what I learned? Uh, <laughs> how many of you know that, that these donuts, which are undefeated when you have them fresh, are not nearly as good the next day? A Krispy Kreme donut the next day, I don't know what it is. It's like in Shrek, you know, when Fiona at night turns into something entirely different. That is the equivalent of what happens to the fabric of a Krispy. When you wake up, if you didn't eat that Krispy Kreme donut the day before, when, it, when you wake up, how do you know? You don't, you don't want to eat that. It, it gets stale. It gets a weird, like, stickiness that you can't get off your fingers. It gets this, like, squishy, soggy, it's like, no, it doesn't get hard. It gets even softer, which is not a compliment. Um, <laughs> Krispy Kreme donuts are amazing when you get them the same day. But come on, anybody. If you wait till the next day, it's not the same. <laughs> now, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. I think I have to do something that's gross. So bear with me. I didn't think that one through, yeah. <laughs> what, what's the point? What's the point? Well, how many of you know that the best bread is fresh bread? And as cheesy as this example is, I, I think it works well because when it comes to our walk with Jesus, listen to this, it works the same way. You see, Jesus does not want to give us yesterday's bread, but he actually wants us or wants to be our daily bread. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus teaches us to pray along these lines. He says, pray this way, Lord, give us this day. Everyone say this day our daily bread. Simply, we are invited to have a fresh encounter with Jesus every single day. Jesus is not just the bread of yesterday. Come on, somebody. He wants to be your bread for today. In the Old Testament, there's this interesting story about God providing manna from heaven. We talked about it. The Israelites, um, they were in slavery in Egypt when they cried out to God, and God came and he rescued uh, over three million Israelites in the supernatural way out of Egypt, and, and he sent them on a journey. He said, hey guys, I've actually prepared land for you. I've prepared a space where I want you to call home, and I want you to leave Egypt, and I want you to go to this place. And the Bible said it took almost 40 years. There's a lot of reasons why complaining had a lot to do with it, and uh, a number of things, but... Uh, one of the things that happened that's so interesting in the story of Israel and became quite a pivotal part of um, kind of the Israelites' history was this experience with God and bread. You see, on the journey in the wilderness, they got hungry. And uh, as you can imagine, when they were in Egypt, they were slaves, but they had food regularly. But now, for the first time in their life, they're all on their own. They have to procure food by themselves. They're in a wilderness, in a desert. There's not much to eat. And so they get hungry, and, and they cry out to God, God, where are you? We, we need food. And and God actually listens to this prayer, even though it's a bit of a complaint, and he actually starts to provide for them. And he provides for them in a pretty interesting way. The Bible says that each morning, God would send them fresh manna from heaven. And manna was really just this kind of white, flaky bread that would appear on the ground each morning, and it would satisfy the needs of every person who was in the Israelite camp. But God had an interesting command for them about this bread. I think it's worth us remembering and even noting as it relates to Jesus being our bread. You see, they were only supposed to go and get enough bread for that day. For that day. And they weren't allowed, and God asked them to not save any of that bread from today for tomorrow. They, 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 they couldn't eat yesterday's bread. Exodus 16, we see this exchange. Verse 4 says, the Lord said to Moses, look, I'm going to rain down food from heaven for you. Each day, the people can go out and pick up as much as they need for that day. Then a little later, verse 17, so they went out, and some gathered a lot, some only a little. But when they measured it out, everyone had just enough. This is amazing. Then Moses told them, do not keep any of it until tomorrow. 
Well, they didn't listen. Verse 20, some didn't listen and they kept it until morning. But then they found out that it was full of maggots and had a terrible smell. They got a Krispy Kreme donut today. They saved it till tomorrow. And it did not serve them. It was no good. You see, the bread God supplied was meant to be a daily bread. This was intended to be a blessing, to be something that sustained them and helped them, but also to train their faith. They were to trust God that he would be faithful to supply what they needed and how much they needed each and every single day. And church, can I remind you that the same is true for us. Here's the deal. In our walk with Jesus, this is where we all start. Learning to not just come to him in crisis, but rather learning to lean on him for what we need each and every day. He's the bread of life, and he is our daily bread. A sign of maturity in our faith is when we move from seeking God for our next spiritual high to finding the depth of nourishment that comes from simple daily devotion. You see, we were never meant to be Christians living on leftovers. And I think far too often believers can find themselves living out their faith on the fumes of yesterday's fire. We cling to the encounter we had with God yesterday or a month ago or at a summer camp or at a conference or on a missions trip or any other experience that has now come and gone. Many Christians are trying to get back to the good old days to get back to those old experiences, singing the same old songs and listening to the same, seeking to encounter God the way they met him five years ago or the way they met him when they were at that church or the way they met him when they were in high school or the way that they saw him when they were at a revival meeting. But hear this church, God is not interested in taking you back to where you've already been. He wants to do a new thing in your life today. He wants to do something fresh. He's the God of the daily bread. Isaiah 43 it commands and says, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing, and now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will, meet, I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I was always so surprised when we moved uh, from the old church building we used to meet in to this building, how many people struggled to make that move. And you want to know what so many people said? They said, this new place doesn't feel like it used to feel at the old place. Because at the old place, that, that's where I met God at the old place, on that old carpet, in those old chairs. So often we can struggle to remember God actually has a pretty direct command. It is time to forget to leave behind, be grateful for, but leave behind what was, because he has so much new to do in our future. The question is not, is God doing a new thing? That's not what's asked. The question is, am I perceiving what God is doing? You see, I truly believe, church, that God wants to do something new in every area of your life, in your marriage, in your finances, in your parenting, in your career, in your calling, God wants to move, speak, and show himself to you in ways you have never seen. He wants to wake us up out of the mundane, to light a fire in places that have grown cold, to call us onto the waters of faith once again. The question is, will you let go of yesterday's manna and allow him to do it in your life? Matthew 5, 6, Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Can I encourage you today, if it's been a while since you've seen God do something new and fresh, of your, and fresh in your life, to get hungry for him again. We're often looking, hear this, for a move from God, but he is looking for a move from you. I want to say that again. We are often looking for a move from God, but he is looking for a move from us. I want to invite you to seek the Lord. Ask him for daily bread. Position your heart to hear from him. Lean upon him. He is the bread of life, and he wants to be your bread every single day. Secondly, and this is, remember, only two points. Made it easy on us today, didn't I? First, he's our daily bread. But secondly, Jesus is our true bread, our true bread. A few months ago, um, I tried to go gluten-free. 
Has anybody ever tried this? For years, uh, my wife has eaten a gluten-free lifestyle. And I've noticed the way that it's helped her energy, uh, it's helped her overall health, so I thought I'd give it a try. But here's the problem. Gluten is in almost everything. Well, at least everything that I like to eat. <laughs> in particular, gluten is found in bread. And come on somebody, I really, really like to eat bread. I like bread in all its ways, okay? <laughs> so Alexa goes, oh, no, it's okay. I'll buy us some gluten-free bread. She said we could use this as an alternative, but I can assure you today, church, that this gluten-free bread, it is not bread. <laughs> you see, it looks like bread. It smells like bread. It even has a bread-like taste. But come on, this is not real bread. And actually, I noticed it, it lacks some of the key ingredients that my body was used to to help me feel full. So I found no matter how much I would eat this stuff, I toasted it and I baked it and I put butter on it and no matter how much, I would never feel full. Like I could eat this all day and, and it never filled me up. And so despite my best attempts, I only lasted about nine days eating gluten-free. And then I went back to the real thing. Come on, somebody. <laughs> What's the point? What's the point? I think in life, many of us are used to consuming counterfeit sources of sustenance. That although they may have the resemblance of the real thing, they do not truly satisfy and fill the hunger that lives within book of James chapter 4, James puts some interesting language to this. He says, what's causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You're, you're jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are wrong. You only want what will give you pleasure. It's like the old country song that goes, we've been looking for love in all the wrong places. And despite our best attempts, we're never able to find what we're looking for because we are looking everywhere but the one place that can truly satisfy us. So here's our question. What do we do with the things we're hungry for? With the things we crave, with the things we want, with the things we desire and, 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 and ache for? I, I think the truth is, is that the Christian model that is often presented when it comes to our desires and our longings has often missed the mark in being helpful. Often the way of Jesus is presented, hear this, as a way of repressing what we desire. It's often taught that following Jesus is all about killing off our desires, shutting down what we want and fighting against what we're hungry for. Like we're constantly waging war against all these things we want that we shouldn't have. It's almost like God is presented as the great killjoy of life. And with this mindset, Christianity, if we're not careful, can be reduced to nothing more than a spiritual effort in behavior modification and management. But not only has that pattern proved to be ineffective, I think it's also led to Christians everywhere living with deep layers of shame harboring secret sins and being confused on how do I reconcile my flesh with the high standard of God. But this morning, if I can, I wanna help somebody. I, I'd like to suggest that when Jesus says he is the bread of life, that he is wanting to show us another way. You see, the message of the gospel is not so much about repressing what we desire but rather about redirecting what we desire to the very place where what we long and ache for can finally be satisfied and fulfilled. The invitation of Jesus is not to kill off what you want, but to come to him and find everything you actually wanted. 
You see, when we get past the surface of what we desire, what we long for, what we, what we want more than anything, when, when, when we get to the desire behind the desire, what we find is that our desires are not leading us from God. They are actually leading us right to the person of Jesus. Let me give you a few examples. Maybe you're single today and you're looking for the bread of marriage. You desire to be married more than anything. It can feel all consuming and, and marriage is awesome and, and I, I want you to be as well. But how many of you know that often the desire behind the desire to be married is the desire to actually be deeply known, deeply loved and to find true companionship. And as beautiful as marriage is, at the end of the day, it is Jesus and only Jesus who can truly satisfy that longing and desire. Maybe you're looking for the bread of relief, craving to consume anything from alcohol to drugs to Netflix to take the edge off. But the truth is that the desire behind the desire for a quick hit of relief is actually to find deep and real lasting rest for your soul. And no matter how much you consume or watch or binge, it is a Jesus and only Jesus who can give you the real and lasting rest you truly want. Maybe you're looking for the bread of approval, craving the attention and affirmation that comes from posting pictures of yourself, searching for compliments or bragging about what you've done well. But the true desire behind that desire is to find a sense of deep belonging and self-worth for who you are as you are. No matter how much attention or praise you get from someone else, there is only one who can give you the approval and affirmation your soul so desperately needs to flourish. Again, rather than repressing what we desire, what if we redirected our desires to the person of Jesus? I believe, church, as we do, that we'd find ourselves filled not with something that's counterfeit, like gluten-free bread, but something that satisfies us, like the true bread we've desired all along. Psalm 107 verse nine promises, it says, he satisfies the longing soul. He fills the hungry soul with goodness. Jeremiah 21, 21, or 31, 25 says, for I have satisfied the weary soul and I have replenished every sorrowful soul. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus invites us. He says, come to me, come to me, come to me, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened and hungry, and I will give you rest. Jesus is our true bread. There is no substitute. There is no alternative. There is no counterfeit that can satisfy us the way he can. If you are hungry today, if you are longing today, then I can I encourage you to let your longings lead you to Jesus. He is the true bread of life. This morning, I started by asking you this question. Have you ever lost something only to realize that what you thought you lost, you actually had all along? Well, as we close today, I don't know your story. I don't know if you feel like something has been missing in your life, like you've been hungry for something that you just can't seem to get, like you've been looking for something but not able to find it. Well, today, maybe, just maybe, the very thing you thought you were searching for has actually been with you all along. The thing you've been hungry for, the thing you've been craving, his name is Jesus. He is the bread of life and he alone can fill what you need. Maybe you've been wrestling with alcohol or addiction, hoping the next hit, the next drink, the next experience will give you what you want. Can I encourage you today, come to Jesus. Maybe you've been feeling discouraged and disappointed in your lot in life, feeling like, like, like everybody else has what you don't, like you're missing out and you'll never get where you wanna be. Can I invite you to come to Jesus? Maybe you're living with wounds from your past, the words of a father or mother that have haunted you, the shame of your mistakes and sins and wrongdoings and the things that you've done or have been done to you. Can I implore you today, church, come to Jesus. He is the bread of life. He is the satisfier of our souls. Come to Jesus, church. Come to Jesus because he is all we need. And as we close, I wanna do so by praying for you. And I wanna do so by spending some time singing to him. Can we all stand to our feet all across the room? The team's coming and they're gonna sing and we're gonna sing with them. But before we do, I just wanna take a moment to pray. 
for those in the room that are hungry. You've had a hung, hunger that you feel like hasn't been satisfied. Maybe today there's a fresh hunger for God and the things of God that's stirring in your soul. Today, if you've walked into church with hunger, with longing, with aching, maybe you've been struggling with addiction. Maybe you've been wandering and lost in your career. How do I get what I'm craving? How, how do I, I'm trying, I'm working. Maybe you've been longing and you feel like it's not satisfied. Today, I want you to know you can encounter the one who is the true bread of life. So every head bowed, every eye closed. If that's you, I wanna pray for you all across the room. Would you lift your hand to heaven? Say, Eric, that's me today, I'm hungry. I'm hungry for God. I'm hungry for some things that haven't filled me and satisfied the way I desire. I see hands going up all across the room. Father, I thank you so much for your people. I thank you so much for your love for them. I thank you, Lord, that you are our bread of life, that nothing, oh, nothing can satisfy us the way you can. I ask you, Lord, to show yourself faithful and true to the people in this room as the bread of life in a way they've never felt before. I pray that you would break through our religiosity, our tendency to assume we already know everything we need to know about you, but you would instill a hunger within your church to want and long and ache and crave for you and you alone more than they ever had in their life. I pray you would satisfy every need of their soul. I pray you would bring comfort and contentment and deep joy and meaning to those, Father, who need it today. I thank you that you are all we need. And now as we sing and we worship, I pray you would speak this word right to us how we need it. In Jesus' name, amen.